Hello everyone, I'm Bridget Surratt with Canada Patient Resource Connection and welcome to the third class in our leadership conference series called Effective Storytelling. While we are a cannabis group, I do want to remind you that everything you see here can be used towards any issue with any political party. This is general information about how to effectively tell your story when you are up speaking to elected officials. We did a survey in our group and asked who people thought were great speakers and why. And these are some of the responses that we got. Uh, Ellen DeGeneres, Malala, in case people don't know who Malala is, Malala survived an attack from ISIS simply because she wanted to go to school and she is a very strong advocate for education in uh, Middle Eastern countries and around the world. And then, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King, who should need no explanation. Stories sell. Whether it's a product or a concept, all of these companies like Advocare, Mary Kay, Avon, uh, and all of these different companies, they use stories to sell lifestyle concepts. If you consider it uh, look at the dairy industry. You're not really buying milk. You're buying your body's health because it does a body good. And if you're you're buying car insurance, you're not buying plain old car insurance. You're buying security. It's like having a good neighbor there and it makes you feel good. So your story is incredibly important because it can be used to ins from for everything from inciting revolution to even recommending pizza. So within the first 30 seconds, you need to establish your why. This is incredibly important. Interact with your audience. Introduce yourself, grab their attention, and thank them for their time. Ideally, you should introduce yourself first uh, and then go into who you are and your why. Be sure you interact with your audience. A lot of times we find elected officials tend to get distracted behind their podiums and uh, their computers up there and tend to look at their phones. If you're interacting with them, it's a little more difficult for them to lose uh, attention span. Your story. Here we have the typical who, what, where, when, why, and how. However, for the most part, each story absolutely needs to include the who, the what, the why, and the how. The where and the when may or may not be relevant to your story, and it's always best to keep out details that aren't relevant to your point. How to speak. Watch your posture. Don't stand there looking uh, slumped over, arms folded, that sort of thing. Watch your posture. Stand tall. Stand there with confidence. Don't be monotone. It really doesn't work well, and people tend to fade off and go to sleep. Understand you are painting a picture for your audience. If your audience cannot visualize the why and the how and your story, it's going to be a lot harder for them to receive and empathize with it. Smile. One of the biggest mistakes we make is not smiling when we are up speaking to our elected officials. A lot of times we come either from a place of anger or extreme nervousness, and we tend not to smile, and that never creates a good atmosphere for reception of your idea, which ultimately is the point. Make eye contact if possible. It's not always possible, but definitely try to. Watch your body language. If your arms are folded, your message is not going to be received if you're tapping your foot or you're standing in a, a very negative and combative way. How you do things matters just as much as what's coming out of your mouth. And remember, stay on topic. Don't go off on tangents. Many times we see people with timed speeches lose their topic and go off on a tangent only to never get to their point. Be sure that you stay on topic. According to Julian Treasure, <clears throat> avoid gossip, judgment, negativity, complaining, excuses, lying, 
and dogmatism. Do not use those when you are in an arena where you have to speak to elected officials and you are trying to influence people's judgment. Those things will never get you anywhere and oftentimes they will polarize people further away from where you would like them to be. <clears throat> the four foundations of powerful speech according to Mr. Treasure. The acronym is HAIL. And I really like this. Honesty, authenticity, be yourself, which is essential for you to be effective, integrity, and love. And my philosophy is this. If you speak with honesty, integrity, and from a place of love and kindness, as long as you are yourself, whatever comes out of your mouth is going to be just fine. Be yourself. Stay true to your cause. And just remember, speak honestly, speak with integrity, and try to come from that place of love. A lot of these issues are very emotional for us, uh, and we tend to speak out of places of anger. And I don't care what your message is or how wonderful your message is, if you're angry at somebody and combative with somebody, you, you won't be received. And the point is for your message to get across. When you are speaking, uh, Mr. Treasure recommends speaking from the, the chest with depth, power, and authority. You absolutely need to speak from a place of confidence. Again, with the uh, understanding that combative and negative behavior will not be received well, if you speak from a meek place, you also will not be received well. The best responses come from those who are are, who are hearing things from people who speak from confidence. Silence can be highly effective. Use your pauses wisely. One of the biggest mistakes we make is to speak too fast and to not use effective pauses. Those pauses can draw emphasis to points that need to be made and can be incredibly effective speaking tools. Be sure to include the specific policy you're talking about, say, hi, my name is such and such, and I'm here uh, about placing a stop sign at X and Y intersection. Immediately, you've introduced yourself, and you've explained to them which policy you're there to talk about. Make sure you clearly state how this policy has impacted your life. Hi, I'm such and such, here to speak about putting, placing a stop sign at X and Y intersection. Um, this Intersection has been incredibly dangerous, and we've seen five accidents in the last two months. Have your neighbors or your family been affected by this policy? You could then go on to add, my neighbors were involved in those accidents, and two children were hurt. How would you change this policy? And then why would you make those changes? So you would add something in that case, uh, I would definitely support adding stop signs at X and Y intersection because it will make our neighborhood safer for the children and families living near and around those streets. Pretty simple. When you close, always thank the audience for their time. Always thank them for their time. And end by repeating your main idea. Your main idea is what you want to leave them with when you walk away. Uh, so it's always important to make sure that the main idea and your point does not get lost. Generally speaking, I uh, will add a sentence at the end. Thank you very, very much for your time and take, you know, listening to our concerns. And please, I urge you to support Bill XYZ. Uh, and that way, it's very clear what I'm asking of them and very clear what my intent was. Common mistakes. Speaking too fast. A lot of people generally tend to speak too fast and it begins to get really annoying after a while and you can't get any type of reaction from that. Generally speaking, speaking too fast also has the same problem as speaking monotone where people tend to fall asleep because it, it becomes very um, monotonous. No personal insults. I know it's incredibly hard to do, especially when you're dealing with uh, emotional issues that are personally affecting you and your family. 
no personal insulting. You will never, ever, ever get far with that. And the minute personal insults come out, you've lost. Not getting to the point is another huge mistake. And all of that is because people don't prepare. And the results are word vomit. So to avoid word vomit, the number one thing you can do is prepare. Lack of preparation is what happens when people um, think they can wing it and they don't at least write their main ideas that they want to talk about down and they get up to the podium and they're either too nervous um, or they're too verbose. And unfortunately, many people never get to their point and that is not why we are up there speaking. So prepare. Use your note cards. Uh, and it's okay to type out your story and just go up there and read it. You don't have to do to memorize this and put on a theatrical performance. All you have to do is read your own words. And that's okay to do. And so please understand, it is perfectly fine for you to go up. Give a speech that is read. People do it all the time. Teleprompters mean people are actually reading their speeches. It's okay. It's an accepted form of speech. Try not to make one more than try not to make more than one point per minute, uh, simply because you generally tend to have a lot of things that get lost. Uh, what that means is is you may have four or five points that you need to make. If you can make them adequately in less than that, say thirty seconds or so, feel free to do so and add that. Um, but unfortunately, if you can't explain and justify your point, just throwing it out there may not be enough. Uh, understand that you may have to support that point as well. And then practice out loud at least three times. It's kind of like a fire drill. You know, everybody's scared of public speaking, but if you've gone up and you've done it in front of a mirror or if your animals have heard your, your speech uh, thousands of times, when you get up there, it's going to be a lot easier for you to get into the swing of things and just get it over with. Things to watch. <clears throat> your tone and your pitch. Uh, I don't know how many of us have kids, and uh, I can tell you that the tone and the pitch of several things they say, even though they might not be saying bad things, the way that they say it uh, comes across as incredibly obnoxious. So uh, thankfully my kids are grown and adults now and this is not the, the same time, you know, the same thing anymore. But when you are up there, the same principles apply. Watch your tone. Even the best ideas will not be received well when said in a combative manner. You can talk about how amazing, you, you know, your, your personal hero is. But if you're yelling it or you're, you're um, doing it kind of like the iced tea thing where they always ask them to say things in a really, really angry thing, angry face, angry voice, and all of that. And he says the nicest things, but they're angry. Uh, you will not be received well. No vulgarity. Uh, it is never appropriate at a public meeting to use. Never in any situation. Use kind words. Uh, if When you are speaking to others, Always use the kindest, kindest words available. Uh, please remember that everybody is human. And while people may be jerks, people may think differently than we do, they are human. And at the end of the day, it is not okay to treat people uh, in an ugly manner. And remember to speak slowly. More things to watch. Again, never personally insult. And you see that here a lot because we, we've witnessed it. Uh, in meetings with elected officials quite a bit, and it, it never ends well. Uh, there is never anything beneficial that comes with personal insults or vulgarity. Uh, stick to the facts. Clearly state how the policies have imp impacted you, uh, and clearly state how this policy could impact them. If you have a, uh, for instance, let's take our stop sign example, the, the policy impacts you because you live in the neighborhood. But how is it hurting the city as a whole? Is it putting a strain on emergency services? Uh, it, you know, what exactly are the impacts? How is it costing them? If you can take your issue and show that it impacts them and it's in their best interest 
to vote your way, you're going to have an easier time getting your, your uh, issues dealt with properly. Now before you speak, I like this acronym, THINK. Um, I did shamelessly steal this off Facebook, so I don't know who created this meme. Um, but THINK, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? And if you would like to talk about the inspiring, check out uh, Course 1 called Choosing Leadership, and that will be on YouTube shortly. You can change the world. I know a lot of people out there say, my vote doesn't make a difference, my participation doesn't make a difference, and I'm one person, I can't change the world. That's not true. You can change the world, and generally speaking, it is only one or two people pushing and pushing and, and working it that do change things, uh, and they create that momentum. Now, words are our most <clears throat> inexhaustible source of magic capable of both inflicting injury and remedying it. And that's an Albus Dumbledore quote. I uh, love that and a couple other of his. Um, but this is very true. You have the ability to change the world. Uh, and a lot of this does start with words in our language. So your turn to analyze. I have a very quick um, TEDx talk here. You'll find I'm addicted to TEDx talks. I would like you to think about what did you like about, um, oh, I changed it up, it's not her, it's his presentation, and uh, what would you do differently? So I'm going to go ahead and click this uh, and see if I can't get rid of the ad at the front, and then um, we'll go from there. But please look at how Mr. Dudley speaks. Please look at how he's telling his story. What techniques is he using? Are those techniques that you can employ when you go into uh, elected officials or you're approaching the general public, you know, how can you use those same speaking techniques? All right, let's see what we can do about the ads. Well, last thing I want to introduce our new social media manager, Lily. Okay, I'll load in just a second. At least I hope. <laughs> Here we go. To start by asking everyone in the audience here a question. How many of you are completely comfortable with calling yourselves a leader? See, I've asked that question all the way across the country, and everywhere I ask it, no matter where, there's always a huge portion of the audience that won't put up their hand. And I've come to realize that we have made leadership into something bigger than us. We made it into something beyond us. We made it about changing the world. And we've taken this title of leader, and we treat it as if it's something that one day we're going to deserve. But to give it to ourselves right now means a level of arrogance or cockiness that we're not comfortable with. And I worry sometimes that we spend so much time celebrating amazing things that hardly anybody can do that we've convinced ourselves that those are the only things we're celebrating. And we start to devalue the things that we can do every day. We start to take moments where we truly are a leader and we don't let ourselves take credit for it. We don't let ourselves feel good about it. And I've been lucky enough over the last 10 years to work with some amazing people who have helped me redefine leadership in a way that I think has made me happy. And with my short time today, I just want to share with you the one story that is probably most responsible for that redefinition. I went to a school in a little school called Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. And on my last day there, a girl came up to me and she said, I remember the first time that I met you. And then she told me a story that happened four years earlier. She said, on my day before I started university, I was in the hotel room with my mom and my dad. And I was so scared and so convinced that I couldn't do this, that I wasn't ready for university, that I just burst into tears. And my mom and my dad were amazing. They were like, look, we know you're scared, but let's just go to more. Let's 
Let's go with the first day. And if at any point you feel as if you can't do this, that's fine. Just tell us we'll take you home. We love you no matter what. And she says, so I went the next day and I was standing in line getting ready for registration. And I looked around and I just knew I couldn't do it. I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I had to quit. And she says, I made that decision. And as soon as I made it, there was this incredible feeling of peace that came over me. And I turned to my mom and my dad to tell them that we needed to go home. And just at that moment, you came out of the student union building wearing the stupidest hat I have ever seen in my life. It was awesome. And you had a big sign uh, from Woody China Ram, which is Students Fighting Assistant by Bose, a charity I've worked with for years. And you had a bucket full of lollipops. And you were walking along and you were handing the lollipops out to people in line and talking about China Ram. And all of a sudden, you got to me and you just stopped and you stared. It was creepy. <laughs> this girl right here knows exactly what I'm talking about. And then you looked at the guy next to me, and you smiled, and you reached in your bucket, you pulled out a lollipop, and you held it out to him, and you said, you need to give a lollipop to the beautiful woman standing next to you. And she said, I have never seen anyone get more embarrassed faster in my life. He turned beet red. He wouldn't even look at me. He just kind of held the lollipop out like this. And I felt so bad for this dude that I took the lollipop, and as soon as I did, you got this incredibly severe look on your face, and you looked at my mom and my dad, and you said, look at that. Look at that. First day away from home, and already she's taking candy from a stranger. And she said, everybody lost it. 20 feet in every direction, everyone started to howl. And I know this is cheesy, and I don't know why I'm telling you this, but in that moment when everyone was laughing, I knew that I shouldn't quit. I knew that I was where I was supposed to be, and I knew that I was home. And I haven't spoken to you once in the four years since that day, but I heard that you were leaving. And I had to come up and tell you that you've been an incredibly important person in my life. And I'm going to miss you. Good luck. And she walks away. And I'm flat. And she gets about six feet away. She turns around and smiles and goes, you should probably know this too. I'm still dating that guy four years later. <laughs> a year and a half after I moved to Toronto, I got an invitation to their wedding. Here's the kicker. I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that moment. And I've searched my memory banks because that is funny. And I should remember doing it. And I don't remember it. And that was such an eye-opening, transformative moment for me to think that the, maybe the biggest impact I'd ever had on anyone's life, a moment that had a, a woman walk up to a stranger four years later and say, you've been an incredibly important person in my life, was a moment that I didn't even remember. How many of you guys have a lollipop moment, a moment where someone said something or did something that you feel fundamentally made your life better? All right. How many of you have told that person they did it? See, why not? We celebrate birthdays where all you have to do is not die for 365 days. And yet we let people who have made our lives better walk around without knowing it. And every single one of you, every single one of you has been the catalyst of the lollipop moment. You have made someone's life better by something that you said or that you did. And if you think you have it, think about all the hands that didn't go back up when I asked that question. You're just one of the people who hasn't been told. But it is so scary to think of ourselves as that powerful. It can be frightening to think that we can matter that much to other people. Because as long as we make leadership something bigger than us, as long as we keep leadership something beyond us, as long as we make it about changing the world, we give ourselves an excuse not to expect it every day from ourselves and from each other. Marianne Williamson said, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that frightens us. And my call to action today is that we need to get over that. We need to get over our fear of how extraordinarily powerful we can be in each other's lives. We need to get over it so we can move beyond it. And our little brothers and our little sisters, and one day our kids, or our kids right now, can watch us start to value the impact we can have on each other's lives more than money and power and titles and influence. We need to redefine leadership as being about lollipop moments. How many of them we create, how many of them we acknowledge, how many of them we pay forward, and how many of them we say thank you for. Because we've made leadership about changing the world, and there is no world. There's only six billion understandings of it. And if you change one person's understanding of it, one person's understanding of what they're capable of, one person's understanding of how much people care about them, one person's understanding of how powerful and agent for change they can be in this world, you change the whole thing. And if we can change, understand leadership like that, I think if we can redefine leadership like that, I think we can change everything. And it's a simple idea, but I don't think it's a small one. And I want to thank you all so much for letting me share it with you today. Have a great day at 10. I'll see you later. Excellent. That was Drew Dudley's TEDx talk called Leading with Lollipops, and it can be found on YouTube. And please think about what did you like about his presentation, and what would you change about it? And then incorporate those things into your speaking. And then go ahead and practice.
and reanalyze. It's okay to practice in front of a mirror. It's okay to practice your facial expressions. It's okay to practice your timing. And it is okay to flub up and understand that. Again, thank you very, very much for joining our class. And we hope you guys have a great day. Please be sure to check out the other two courses in this series. There's one called Choosing Leadership, and then there's another called Advocacy Strategies that goes over how to navigate public meetings uh, and certain strategies you can use to be an advocate in your community.